Welcome back. It's still Plus Politics. We want to look at the Naira and Kobo. A few days ago, President Muhammadu Buhari presented a budget of 13.08 trillion Naira with a crude oil benchmark price of $40 per barrel, a projected inflation rate of 11.95% and GDP growth rate of 3.00% was considered. Oil revenue is projected at 2.01 trillion naira. Non-oil revenue is estimated at 1.49 trillion naira. These and much more was said by the president about the proposed budget. Joining us to discuss this is the senior special assistant to the president on public affairs, Ajiri Ingilali. Good evening, Ajiri. Good evening, my dear brother. Thank you for having me. Yeah, network has been acting phony, but let's hope that we could still reconnect. Uh, but before we stop, start talking about Naira and Kobo, on this side, I think uh, it is quite unprecedented to see how the president has... Uh, let's start with the issue of NSAS protest, just his comments to see, uh, you know, the response of the president. That comes quite uh, soothing. Uh, do you want to say one or two things about how the president has responded to say that uh, the reform... Has already started. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, of course, uh, we have heard uh, directly from the president uh, following a series of uh, tangible steps taken, not just by the president, but of course, uh, the vice president and uh, the inspector general of police. Uh, furthermore, today uh, we also saw the inspector general of police uh, meet uh, with some leaders of the protest, uh, at which he informed the protesters that, of course, uh, already the the training of the re, of the unit that will replace uh, SARS uh, is going to uh, commence training next week. Uh, so we are very very co uh, confident uh, that with the tangible steps taken, uh, that we can uh, build uh, the required trust and cooperation required uh, to put uh, this unfortunate episode behind all of us. Okay, let's quickly now go to the issue of budget, which is the real reason why you are here. Uh, let's look at the $40 per barrel. Some economists seem to say that that's quite overambitious. C can you tell us why, how we arrive at that $40 per barrel? Well, I, I think mean, sorry, it's, it's very much in line with market realities. I, I think it's a bit surprising that uh, anyone would define it as ambitious, given the fact that today, for example, uh, Brent crude is currently trading trading today, I believe, at $43 uh, per barrel. We have seen uh, an increase uh, in, in over recent days. Of course, you know very well uh, that over the last uh, several months, uh, given the impact of COVID-19, not just on Nigeria, but on uh, global economies around the world, uh, that indeed many nations uh, were, were made to revise the 2020 estimates of their respective budgets, and we were no different. So at any point in time, uh, anything can be revisited. Uh, nothing is, uh, is, 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 un, is immovable. Uh, but for us, uh, we are very happy uh, to, to leave uh, the benchmark uh, where it presently is at, as it is reflective of market realities. Yeah, let's look at the budget performance in 2020, which the president also alluded that uh, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to the estimate, there are some many that have been made to fund that budget. And he also made a, a reference to uh, the grant that is expected and with so much emphasis. Uh, can you explain more? Because some felt, why should we rejoice over grants to fund our budget? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I don't know that anybody is asking anybody to be clapping or dancing or, 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 or rejoicing at a time when uh, the nation is facing uh, down uh, at an economic recession. Uh, there's, look, there's no magic to this, and there's no sugar coating it. The president is not in the business of propaganda, and neither are we. Uh, we are interested in telling our people what things are, what the truth is, where we are, and what needs to be done to make sure that tomorrow is better than today. Uh, so for us now, uh, in very specific terms, uh, we all know that the South, Afri South Africa's GDP has contracted by 40%. Uh, the Nigeria, Nigeria's GDP has contracted by 6%. And the, the, we're even expecting to move back into positive growth by the first quarter of next year. So, yes, things are, 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 are not easy at the moment. We have lost 60% of our revenue since January. That is not a secret. Uh, so, clearly, we are facing uh, an economic recession. Now, the challenge, the, the, the challenge that's presented 
uh, also provides opportunity to uh, to to bring about solutions uh, that will uh, you know uh, emanate uh, you know that will manifest rather uh, prominent solutions. And we're talking about obviously with the removal of oil subsidy, massive investment in infrastructure across the country captured within this budget, and of course continuous investment in our social investment program in expanding those. We believe that the engine room of the future of Nigeria's economy is our people rather than just oil and gas. And that is why you're seeing unprecedented interventions from the 75 billion Naira survival fund made up of grants, not loans, from the expansion of the uh, social investment programs and also the introduction of the National Youth Investment Fund, uh, as well as the special public works program where we're recruiting 1,000 young persons from every local government area of the federation uh, to conduct a labor intensive operation to reconstruct roads uh, and, and rebuild the nation's economy. So we are very optimistic about the implementation of this budget. Okay, Ajiri, so that you understand that uh, this is not really about criticizing the government. One of the things I did say on this show when we look at the budget was the fact that when there is infrastructure, for example, if the rail gets finished, there's definitely going to be massive employment. Someone will be selling the tickets, someone will be handling the, uh, the se several jobs will come in. But a lot of people need a bit of clarity on what is the repayment plan to some of these loans in terms of the government uh, uh, repayment structure? Thank you very much. Uh, well, these things are, are very clear for, I, I think, our, our people to see, particularly those uh, who have been listening closely uh, to all of the, uh, of the uh, government officials uh, who have been coming out very forthrightly to explain these issues. The Minister of Transportation has been out uh, explaining exactly how uh, repayment would work. Uh, I can reiterate uh, that, of course, when you're talking about trains, you're not just talking about, uh, co uh, you know, commuters and passengers and those who are buying tickets, uh, one one ticket or uh, tickets for two or three people. You're talking about cargo, which is why the president, for the first time in our nation's history, uh, at least in our modern history, the president has said it is not good enough just to have trains so that we're uh, showing our people that we're moving into, into rail. It is not, that's not good enough, that we must begin to have a synergized and cohesive uh, transportation, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure master plan that is implemented, meaning that we're moving our rail lines into ports. So you're now seeing, obviously, the Lagos Ibadan rail line, which is in your axis. So I don't even have to tell you uh, about uh, the reality of that project on the ground, something that began construction in 2017. Already we've seen three rides along that axis in, tw in 2020. And now we're just finishing the final extension work from Iju. Uh, to our papa port so that we can not just decongest our ports, depressurize our roads, but ensure that we have a, 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 a means of moving out containers, uh, facilitating import and export flows uh, for the benefit of the entire Nigerian economy. And the president has not stopped there. You would recall that in September, just last month, the president also commissioned the uh, Wari Ajeo Kuta Etakpe rail line which had been neglected for 33 years, since 1987. The president invested heavily in it over the last five years, and now our people have, have seen it open uh, for operation. And the president is not stopping there. He has also approved the e expansion of that rail line uh, to connect with a new Wari seaport, which is going to be constructed, uh, and then on the north side, uh, extending the, that, that rail line up through uh, with a spur to Lokoja up to Abuja so that it can connect with Kano uh, and then, of course, Lagos to the west. This is the kind of integrated trans transportation master plan that will enable us to make massive revenues from, for the, from, from the movement of major uh, cargoes and containers. And that is ultimately what is going to uh, repay those loans quickly and also ensure that after the loans are repaid, uh, that indeed uh, we are uh, benefiting maximally uh, from the operation of those rail lines. So it really goes beyond passengers and, uh, and ticket sales. That is small change compared to what we're talking about. Okay, let's look at the sectorial distribution now in terms of the budgeting. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of those write-offs. You might call it cynical, but the man on the street believes some of those stories. So I will give you opportunity to explain that. The argument on... Um, why should we have some kind of increase from 2020 budget in terms of allocation to the National Assembly being increased? And when he talks to, about security, there is some kind of slight decrease. What's the explanation you have to do to make? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, those, those two issues uh, are being misconstrued. I think uh, anyone who has done an empirical analysis of the 2021 budget uh, would know that uh, some of those uh, premises are just not uh, quite accurate. First of all, the notion that uh, defense, uh, defense or security uh, has been undermined or reduced in any way, I think is, is, is false. I think if you look at the fact that it's the opposite, what, what has happened in terms of the increase in emoluments provided for our armed forces, provided for police, uh, provided for all sorts of uh, various professionals within uh, the, the, the government bureaucracy, including teachers and doctors and the like. If you look at the recurrent expenditure in terms of the, uh, the, the, the defense uh, sector, you will know that it has gone up to about 880 billion. That is a massive increase over what was provided in 2020. Why is that? Because all of us recognize uh, that we require more manpower to deal with the issues that we're facing, ranging from banditry in the Northwest to insurgency in the Northeast and criminality and kidnapping in between. So these are issues that are being tackled, and that is reflective uh, in, in the budget. And it's important to note that there is more to uh, you know, securing uh, this country than uh, just providing arms uh, to, our, to, our, to, our, you know, to our armed forces and ensuring that they have the equipment. Those are obviously extremely important. What is also important is making sure that for the first time in our nation's history, our gallant armed forces who are sacrificing their lives and, of course, making uh, tremendous sacrifices, even in terms of their family members, uh, for them to fight for us, to keep us safe, that we are also showing them tangible appreciation by making sure that we enhance their welfare, their emoluments, and all of those things uh, that, that, that mean the world to them and their families uh, as they put themselves in harm's way on our behalf. So these are the things that are being done within this budget, and really we're quite proud uh, of, the, of the adjustments we've been able to, to make to accommodate the needs uh, of our armed forces. Another commendable part of this budget for some analysts is the aspect of, you know, increase in the health sector, uh, no thanks to the pandemic. Um, but what is the strategy to ensure that we have quite, you know, huge percentage in budget performance? Well, I, I'm quite happy that you raised that because really it's not just that. Uh, it, it goes, it goes uh, across the human development uh, you know, uh, sectors. If you look at the UK, you've cited health care. We have now seen in health care in the 2021 budget uh, enjoy a 157% increase in capital allocation to the health sector uh, as against the 2020 budget. Uh, that is obviously uh, fundamentally uh, you know, uh, you know, transformative in the capacity it will have uh, to provide the kinds of infrastructure and support uh, to the sector required uh, to ensure that we don't just have a, a population that, of course, is in, uh, you know, of course, very industrial, uh, genius, and all of the things that we know Nigerians are hardworking, but that they're also healthy because we know that health is wealth. And people need to be healthy if they're going to effectively contribute to the nation's economy. And that's what the president understands. With that said, uh, I want to be very precise about something. One of the major uh, failures of public analysis as it relates to uh, the health and education sectors in this country is the notion that the Ministry of Health budget is reflective of government investment in the health sector. And also, furthermore, that the Ministry of Education budget is reflective of federal intervention in the education sector. I think it's very important for us to note that the Constitution is very clear that the obligation for funding uh, primary education, primary health care is constitutionally man uh, mandated uh, to the state government. And we know that, uh, unfortunately, many of, the, many of the state governments over a period of time, despite, of course, taking 48% of the nation's revenues, have not adequately invested in those sectors. And oftentimes what happens is the public analysis says, ah, President Mohamed Buhari is not investing in health care and education, when in fact, the reality is, of the matter is that the federal government of Nigeria is mostly an interventionist arm in those two sectors. And the president has been very, very diligent in making sure that those two sectors have been supported. Uh, the state governments have received support. That is why even within the 2021 budget, aside from okay. the 127 billion that you see uh, for, the, for the health sector, you are also going to acknowledge that there was 35 billion set aside for the basic health care provision fund. A fund that has now been operationalized by this administration to serve as a form of UBEC 
to, uh, to serve as a counterpart fund for okay. state governments to be able to more effectively invest in primary health care because we know that in primary health and primary education they comprise about 75 to 80 percent of the total expenditure burden okay. of the health and education sectors but unfortunately we are not doing enough i think in the public domain in terms of you know the the kinds of conversations we're having in the media to effectively you know inform our people about how these things work so that they will also have as much scrutiny on the state budget as we are having on the federal right, budget. Right, I think this is very right, fundamental. Very, very. I totally agree with you. Very, very fundamental because a good number of us are here to actually uh, you know, distribute these functions. I'm so sorry that our time is fast spent. Uh, it's never enough when we are having this conversation. But please, if you can do me a favor for 15 seconds, if it is possible, there is a controversy that also came up from that budget presentation, and that's the IPPIS that if you're not there, don't expect any pay. Is that clear enough to the lecturers or who is this targeted at? My dear brother, let me just say very quickly that the president has made it very clear uh, that his heart and the resources of the nation are going to be devoted to the welfare of our teachers and our lecturers in this country. That is why he has, he has created a new special salary package for our teachers. That is why he's making provisions uh, for our teachers' welfare and the welfare of their families within this budget. And I think uh, that is an acknowledgement of the fact that as long as our teachers and our lecturers are, are, are ready to play it straight with the Nigerian people and ensure that they're not putting their selfish interests above the interests of the future of this country. Those children and young, young adults that are suffering because of the strikes in that sector, then I think those will, those will be the ones who will enroll in the IPPIS because they will have nothing to hide. And the president is very clear. He is not going to move and he is not going to let any set of okay. individuals, no matter with the sector, uh, hold this nation to ransom, hold our children and young people to ransom. This country must move forward and we must be able to streamline the operations of these sectors. Thank you so much. You've done so well with the timing. Thank you, Ajiri Ngalali. Uh, the conversation continues on all our social media platforms. So you could actually, if you have not subscribed to Plus TV Africa, you can do that because as much as we post this comment, you can continue the engagement with the public. Thank you for your time, Ajiri Ngilale. God bless you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a very short break. In fact, a breather. And when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Please stay with us. And here is my take. While it is not surprising that there will be denial over vote buying, it is rather hurting and worrying that the perpetrators are more audacious and shameful in the act. The reason is not far-fetched. There has not been deterrence, neither is there any clear preventive mechanism to frustrate these scavengers. Call corruption a monster or describe it as endemic it seems it doesn't prick the conscience of many of these politicians. But one thing that is incontrovertible is that those monies are only investments which must be recouped either through non-completion of projects or further tax burdens on the impoverished citizens. So who loses? I ask, who loses? It is the people. I insist that the solution primarily lies with the citizens would you say no to these characters and throw this money at them? Then we can ask for accountable and transparent governance. And that's my take on the issue. My name is Kyle Delade and the Plus Politics returns tomorrow, same time, on the same station. And bye for now.